Welcome to our next lecture by uh, Pablo from Alliance. He will be speaking of uh, how to convert lower level signals to user profiles. My name is Pablo, I'm with development at Alliance, as it says here, and for the next 40 minutes or so, I will be practicing my English on you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, my presentation is not uh, so much humor ridden as the last one, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that last joke because uh, you won't get much more of it. Uh, I also apologize in advance, but I also don't have that, that good of a memory, so I have my notes here. Um, uh, so if you, I'm looking at the chair, it's not because I admire it that much, I just want to remember what I wanted to say. Try to focus on it, on the presentation, with the, with the pointer. Oh, okay, great. So, first of all, what is Adiens all about? Um, so, we're leading the user-centric mobile revolution, which doesn't mean anything. <laughs> what we're trying to say about that sentence is that first we want to harness deep learning and other machine learning techniques to profile mobile ad users. We want to know as much as we can about native mobile ad users. But we also want to distill the user app interaction, the interaction of the user with the application, how the users use the applications. And we want to get actionable segmentation data, data that can actually be used later by the application developers. And we'll now talk about how we, act, we can actually achieve it and what we did in Adiens to achieve these things. So first of all, I want to give you a, a little glimpse to the future of the uh, final product. The final product is a dashboard that the app developer can look at and he gets some data from it. He gets on the left column data regarding all his users, 65% uh, being male, 28% being female. If it seems like there are some percents missing, it, it's because of uh, low certainty, low, uh, low confidence, so they're not uh, represented here. Uh, you can also see uh, uh, the country distribution. But on the right column, you get a subset of those users. On the right column, we're only looking at the engaged users, those users, those users that use the application the most. So you can see that the numbers add up to only 13% because that's the amount of users, only 13% of all the users are actually engaged with the app. And we see that males are more inclined to being engaged with the app. So that's the type of insights that we wish to bring to the app developer. And so a bit about what I want to talk about here. First of all, I want to talk about our architecture, but more importantly, how we're using and leveraging AWS services to create our architecture. I'll try to describe it from the bottom up. I'll try to start from the smallest parts and the way we, we've built this architecture during the last couple of years since we started working on this product. And so you'll see a bit of our timeline, how we advanced and slowly created uh, the stack that we use today. And just a small uh, sentence about why we decided to use AWS in the first place. Uh, we've heard great things about AWS and how it has a lot of services, a lot of pluggable things that you can just install and run and you don't need to configure anything. It just works that great out of the box. So we did some price comparison with other cloud services and found that AWS is pretty expensive. But though it's pretty expensive, we were looking for something that would be quick to start and that we know that many other companies are using so we can exchange data and information. So we decided to go with AWS. That means that we have some sort of vendor lock. It will be difficult for us if we decide to move to another platform, but I think it's worth it. Uh, that's a separate uh, conversation anyway, so I won't dive any more into that. The things that I will show you now are what we've built uh, during the last two years and uh, through the timeline of these two years. There's the question of whether it's the right thing to do and whether it's built properly. The answer is probably no. We were learning as we went along and I will end this presentation by showing, the, by showing you how I would have done it today and hopefully one day I'll get the development time to actually do it that way. 
So we'll start with Eddie's insights. Okay, so we've built an SDK, we call it the Adians SDK. It already runs on tens of millions of devices. It runs in the background of the device, of the smartphone, but it doesn't interfere with the device's operations because we, want, we don't want to affect the user in any way. It collects raw data from the environment, from the uh, mobile device. Uh, the raw data that we collect is according to the given permissions to the application. So if there's some data that we wish to collect but the application doesn't have the permissions to get it, then we won't collect it. We then reduce dimensionality and anonymize the data. That means that we don't want to get any PII, privately identifiable information, out of the device. That means that we remove anything that could identify the user. That's the anonymization part. And we also reduce dimensionality. We remove any part of the information that isn't essential to us. And that way we make the data a lot smaller. We then collect all the data and send it back to our server. The server is called SDK server. That's a really original name, I know. If you're wondering why we called it that, it was the first SDK and the first server that we built. So it was obvious that we will call them the Adians SDK and the SDK server. Great. So the SDK server, the SDK server needs to receive that data sent to it. So it receives tens of millions of data submissions from the mobile SDK installations per day. That means that every day we need to deal with a couple of tens of millions of data submissions. We also want it to be able to scale by two orders of magnitude because we're that optimistic. We hope that one day aliens will be installed not on tens of millions and not on hundreds of millions, but on billions of devices, so we want our server to be able to uh, provide the service needed to uh, attend that many submissions. Uh, we also want it to handle requests quickly. Why do we want it to handle requests quickly? Because if it receives a request from a mobile device that currently a user is using that device, any, any hanging that we do, any delay in returning the response will, might affect the user, even though it's something that occurs in the background it might affect the user in any way, in some way, if the user is actively using the device at that time. So we don't want to harm the CPU, we don't want to create too much latency on the, uh, uh, on the network connection for the device. And not at all important is to avoid using data. I'm saying it's not all that important because all the other things are much more important than that. Obviously, we don't want to lose data. Any of the data that we lose will harm our process. But we'd rather lose the data than actually, for example, harm the uh, user's experience, for example. So we can lose data if we must, but we should try to avoid it if we can. So the first thing we created is a very simple architecture. First, we have the mobile client running our SDK. The SDK uh, connects to an instance on Amazon EC2, the uh, uh, cloud, uh, uh, cloud computing service. And then the data submitted is just written as is to Amazon S3, which is the simple storage service from Amazon. So it's pretty simple. We just created an instance here in EC2. We, ran, we run an Apache server. Data submission comes as an HTTP REST request, a post HTTP REST request, and it's just submitted as is to S3. The only logic that we actually have in the SDK server is checking the validity of the data. The validity could be two things. It could be checking that the data is uh, well formatted, that we can actually parse it later, but more importantly, it's used for authentication of the data. We don't want a, a we don't want a hostile entity just submitting a lot of data to our servers, causing us our costs to go up and maybe even crashing our server. So it does that verification before writing to S3. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Oh, right. Uh, the, the other advantage of only doing the data validation is that we write the data as fast as possible to S3. That goes back to what I mentioned before regarding not losing data if we can. So if there's some issue that causes our server uh, to stall for some reason, 
then the mobile client will just time out and not affect the user experience. But if there is no stalling or there's no extreme case here, then the, the, the data will be written as fast as possible. Um, but then we found out we need to scale. And one single instance can scale that much. We want to be able to scale out and not just be limited by scaling up at the instance size. So we added two services that Amazon provides, the Elastic Load Balancer and the Auto Scaling. The ELB, the Elastic Load Balancer, balances incoming connections. So we can actually put multiple EC2 instances and the Load Balancer will decide for each request where to forward it. So now we can scale out as much as we want. It's what everyone likes to call infinitely scalable. The Auto Scaling is the one that can make the decisions regarding scaling. Not only scaling out, but also scaling back in. For example, if there's additional load now because an app decided to release a version with our SDK integrated in it, and now we're getting a lot more requests, auto scaling will identify that and add a new instance to our load balancer. But if now the same app decided they don't want to carry our SDK anymore and release the new version without our SDK, then the request coming in will go down the autoscaler will identify that and remove one of the serving instances. So we get infinite scalability here, and not only that, but we don't actually have um, more EC2 instances than we need because autoscaling can remove as well. Uh, another thing that I want to mention about it is how S3 handles it, and the answer is very well. S3 is also, by definition, infinitely scalable. You could misuse it in a way that you won't get that infinite scalability from it, but as long as you're not misusing it, and which basically means that not all the files have very, very similar names when you're writing them. So as long as you're not misusing it, you'll get infinite scalability from it. You can in parallel write as much as you want to it, getting the, uh, the promised performance from it. And last but not least, sure. By the way, how large are your files on S3? The files that we're writing yeah. here, and uh, they're tens of Ks, okay. tens of kilobytes. Small, small, small files. Yeah, yeah, it's small files. Um, one more thing that I want to mention for those of you that already know a bit about the EC2 service is spot instances. Spot instances are, um, are a type of instance that you can create based on availability. Um, so on the upside, they're much, much cheaper. On the downside, they might be unavailable just when you need them, and then you can lose an instance in real time. But it's okay because there are multiple zones in Amazon. That means that if an instance go, goes down in one zone because it doesn't have any available spot instance, the auto scale will automatically start a new instance in a different zone. So this means that we should be able to uh, or we do need to be tolerant of instances going down, but as long as we can tolerate instances going down, we get a much cheaper price for the AWS services. Here, we don't care if an instance goes down, it's okay. A new instance will go up, connect to the load balancer, and get all the traffic that the old instance was serving. Yes? The problem you have is uh, how long it takes to getting up. I agree completely. That's why you should also always have some redundancy. You don't want to have all your instances serving at 100% CPU, 100% memory all the time. You also need some... Uh, some sorry? Some slack. Yeah, I, I was thinking... Sure, <laughs> let's go with some slack. Uh, you, also, you, you always need what I was going to say. You, you always want to keep some margin. Okay, some margin for error. Great. Now that we've collected all the data, we need to do something with it. So we want per device to create insights on the device's owner. When do we want to do it? When we get new data from that device, right? But do we really need to be real time? No, we don't. We can delay the process a bit. We can get the new data from the device and then wait a minute or two before we actually get the insights ready. It's not a real-time process necessarily. On the other hand, we don't want it to be a once-a-day once process because that means that any new data that you get is not utilized immediately, which in some cases would be a waste. So 
We don't necessarily need to be real time, but we don't want to fall that much behind. I think you need more context for that question. So why don't we go ahead in the presentation and you can ask the same question if it still bugs you later on because there's still some data that you're missing to understand the whole picture. Okay? Thanks. So what's in that data report submitted by our SDK to the server? So there are two types of data. The first type of data is a single data point, for example, the device model, the OS version. So to, to actually process the data would mean some statistical analysis, some simple arithmetic operations, nothing more. But there are, there's also a more complex type of data set. That's data matrices that require matrix operations, uh, which is basically machine learning features. It could be machine learning features for time series data, the kind of time series data that we tend to send from our SDK to the server is, for example, the battery level. Okay, You use the device during the day, the battery level drops, then you charge it, the battery level goes up again. It's a series-based data, and it creates matrices of data that we need to process. But it can also be machine learning features on photos. If we do some initial processing of photos and create um, a feature vector for uh, for a photo on the device, and we send that feature, that feature vector back to our service, and we need to do additional processing on it. Those operations are much heavier operations that require matrix uh, arithmetics, which a CPU doesn't do that well. So for that case, we'll want to do GPU operations. GPUs are optimized exactly for that. We've created a simple mechanism, a simple architecture uh, that we've used multiple times, uh, ba ba basing ourselves on the services provided by AWS. This pattern consists of an incoming string of messages using Amazon SQS. SQS is a simple queuing service. It's really simple. You just write a message to it on one end, and you read the message on the other end. And that message that is delivered via the SQS just tells us the key, the file name from the S3 bucket. Then our instances, once they read the message, they know what file they need to work on. So they can go to the input bucket and read that file. Then they do whatever processing they need to do to that data, write it to an output S3 bucket as a separate file, and send to the output SQS a message telling it that here it is. We've finish the job and the results are written to this bucket under this file name. It's important to also note that we can auto-scale here as well. Auto-scaling in this context can just identify that the CPU is uh, over 80%, for example, in the existing EC2 servers, which means that we're getting too many messages and we're not able to process them all. It can also monitor the SQS itself and see that the queue is growing thus understanding that it needs to create an additional instance and add it to the running EC2 servers. Okay, one more thing that I wanted to mention about it is the SQS mechanism. When you read the message from the SQS, that message tells you, tells the server what it actually needs to do, what input it needs to process. What happens if the server that was processing that input crashes in the middle of operations. That data isn't lost. The reason it isn't lost is because the way SQS works, you read a message and the message is left in the queue but hidden. If within a couple of minutes you go back to the queue and tell it to delete the message because you finished processing it, then it will be deleted from the queue. But if it times out because the instance uh, crashed, for example, then uh, after the timeout, it will be visible again and it can be read from the SQS and processed again. So there's one important requirement here and it is that your application running on this instance needs to be event attend. What that means is that if I read a message, process the data and write the results, and right after I've written the results, the instance crashes, 
and when it goes back up, it might read the same message again and process the same input again. Once it processes that same input, we need it to write the results the same way it did before, because we need those results to be considered instead of the old results and not in addition to the old results. So we don't read them twice, we don't have them twice here. Okay? So processing the same data twice should result in the same uh, output. Okay, using that specific uh, basic construct, we created all of this. And um, I, I'm starting here from the reports bucket. That reports bucket is what we saw earlier. That's what the SDK server writes to. So every time we get a data submission from one of our SDKs, it's written into this bucket. But also we send to SQS a message saying, hey, we've got a new submission and we need to process it. And that's what, why we have the device's server. The device's server will receive that message and process the incoming data. How it processes that incoming data is by doing some additional processing on it. What's that additional processing? The one I mentioned before, the CPU processing, the data points, the simple arithmetic and statistics. The results of that processing are written to the devices bucket. So what we're creating in the devices bucket is an object that represents the user's device. We then send an, a message to an additional SQS telling it that we've finished our work. Then we get to our GPU servers. The GPU servers, as I've mentioned, will do the more complicated work, the matrix operations. So again, it reads from the, the reports, the raw data, does the matrix operations and write the results to the same device's object. So those objects now contain a representation of the device. Message is then sent to an additional SQS telling me that the updated representation of the device is ready. And then we have the inside servers. Those inside servers actually take all the results that we've got this far. And from that, they distill the actual insights. Okay, those insights are from what we've seen earlier, it could be uh, the gender, um, uh, it could be gender, it could be the age of the user, and uh, several other examples that I will show later. Uh, so, <clears throat> a bit about that last part, it uses DynamoDB, uh, it's a NoSQL database from Amazon, a uh, service in AWS as a service, it's really easy to use, really simple, again scales indefinitely, uh, it requires some maintenance but it's very, very simple to use, um, sorry, and very fast, yeah, um, uh, so what I wanted to mention about it is to compare it to S3, because they're basically the same, you just write data based on a key, the difference is that S3 is pretty slow, but pretty cheap, DynamoDB is very, very fast. You can get to uh, at most 10 milliseconds if you're using it right for put, and 2 to 3 milliseconds for get. But it's much more expensive, obviously. It's, a, it's a, actually a huge key value store, right? Sorry? It's actually a huge key value store. The way we use it, or generally speaking? Generally speaking. Generally speaking, it's, yeah, but you can say the same about it's S3, not, right? Yeah, it's not like a column-based uh, database like the standard. Uh, it is column based, but it's an implementation over a huge key value store. Um, okay, so what are the advantages of this complicated architecture? First, scalability, because each of these devices, servers, deep learning servers, etc., they, they're all using auto scaling, so they can grow and shrink uh, dynamically. And more importantly, decoupling. We wanted to be able to decouple all these things. For example, let's say that we found a bug in our code that actually creates the insights, meaning the code running on the inside server. And we know that that bug affected a list of 100,000 devices. So now we fixed the code, we deployed it to the inside servers, and we want to reproduce, recreate the insights for those 100,000 devices. All we need to do is just push to this SQS the identifiers of those devices, and the inside server will just go over them, scale if it needs to, to handle the extra load, and create the insights again. Okay? Okay. 
Okay. So we've talked about how we create a profile for the user, but we still haven't talked about the interaction of the user with the application. And that's where the next product, Edience Events, comes in. So we have the Events SDK. It's complementary to the Edience SDK that I've mentioned earlier. It received events, it receives events from the application based on the user's interaction with the app. Some of these events can be automatically generated. For example, we can send an event each time a user opens the app. It's something that's easy for us to identify and we generate events on those automatically. But there are some things also that are custom made that can be defined by the app developer himself. And those are the most important things to him, to the developer. For example, if the developer uses in-app purchases, then an important event for him might be to send us an event each time a user does an in-app purchase. That way we'll know everything we have to know about the users in terms of their in-app purchases, which users purchase more and which less. Then those events that we collect on the SDK, on the device, needs to, need to be sent to our event server. The event server, much like the SDK server, receives a lot of data, but it receives a scale more. It receives hundreds of millions of data submissions from the SDK per day. Hundreds of millions is a bit more, but still we, we're looking to grow. So again, we want it to be able to scale by two orders of magnitude. Again, we want to handle requests quickly. We want our analytics engine to go over all data from the last 30 days because we want to go over all the relevant users. And the relevant users we're really considering last 30 days as those users that are most relevant to the app developer. So it's important for us to have the ability to process all data from the last 30 days. But the most important thing is we want to enrich the data, the events coming in with the user insights that we've created in our previous flow what that means and how we do it. First, we need to create our event server. We already talked about uh, how we can run a server on EC2 with a load balancer and auto scaling, but this time the data that is delivered to us is really, really, really small because an event should be something like the user just made an in-app purchase. That's it. It's very, very small data. If we take each data point as it is and write it to S3, we'll be writing a lot to S3 and it will slow the read down a lot because S3 has some latency in read and write. And it will also cost a lot of money because put and get cost a lot of money in S3. So the, uh, the way we solve that issue is that the EC2 instances write to local storage. They each have a volume attached. EBS is the storage service for storage attached to the running instance, so it's like local hard drive. The EC2 instance writes to a local hard drive a log of all the incoming events. And once an hour, it will take the log that it's written, rotate it into S3, and start anew. That's a great solution. It was very simple for us to implement also, because we just took the application that we created for the SDK server, rewired it a bit, and that's it. We have the solution ready but it does have its downsides. For example, this time around, we can't have an instance go down. If an instance crashes, if we remove an instance dynamically using the auto scale because there's no that much load anymore, then we're losing the file that has been accumulated during the last hour. That's a lot of events that will go to waste. So this time, we can't lose running instances. We can't automatically scale down. So there's room for improvement here. But, as I mentioned, it's something that we built on the run and that was the easiest and simplest way for us to build. Now the fun part. If I have a lot of data, a lot of data from the incoming events and I need to process it somehow, the best way to go would be, obviously, MapReduce. Okay, so what do I do? At the end of each day, I just take all the events from that day that are currently in a bucket to which I've written all those events. I call it the events bucket in S3. We also add an additional mock event. That mock event um, 
represents an active installation because not necessarily everyone that has the application installed actually used it or created events during the last day. So I also add mock events to have some events that will represent every device on which the app is installed. Eventually our purpose is to compare all the app's users in the last 30 days to a certain subset of those users. Okay? What is the subset of those users that I wish to process? It depends on the event sent. Now I'll explain now what I mean. Uh, but if I'm to give an example, so for example, um, I can say that from all of the app's users, 30% are tech-savvy users, which is an important statistic that would be very useful to the app developer. But also, I can create a subset of that of those users. I can create a subset that says, let's look at only 25 to 34 years old males from Germany, for example, who've made purchases exceeding $500 in the last month. So that's a very specific subset of those users. And I can say that for that subset, 70% of users are tax savvy. So not only I can give analytics on the general population, but also a subset of that population. How do I do it? So first things first, I need to run MapReduce. MapReduce, in case you don't know the technology, is a distributed system to take a lot of data, run it on multiple nodes simultaneously, sort the data according to a certain key, and then redistribute it according to that key to multiple nodes to aggregate the data. Okay, so what I just explained is incomprehensible. I'm sure it is. <laughs> But basically what it does, it does a really fancy sort and aggregate with a lot of data. And uh, I think the examples will better explain it. So let's start with the raw data I have. I have the events I received during the last day and I have the mock events I created for install, uh, installations of each app. And now I run the raw to daily map reduce that we've created. What it does, it aggregates the data, the data per app device, day, and event type. For example, a result of that will tell us, a, simple, a single record of the results will tell us that on device 0123, on the 4th January 2016, in the app Latiford, there were in-app goods purchased worth a total of $100. So that's an aggregation. The key is the app, device, day, and event type. The event type is the in-app goods purchasing and the value of that record is $100. So that's the first aggregation that we do. The second aggregation that we do is daily to aggregate. Now we created an aggregation of the data for the last day, but I also have this, those same results for the previous 29 days. So I can take the data from all the last 30 days. And now I can use it to aggregate the data per the last 30 days. So this time around, the results will be uh, app, device, and event type. I've eliminated the day from the key. So this time the results will be a record in the result bucket will be for device 0123, application Blackiford. There were in-app goods purchased worth a total of $1,000. Because this time it's for the last 30 days. So in one day, that that person purchased $100 worth of goods and now it's up to $1,000 for, for the last 30 days. But more importantly, I also enrich the data with the insights. Remember the DynamoDB table with the insights per device? So I now enrich the data and enrich the events with that data. And this means that actually a record written to this bucket will not only have the key and the $1,000 value, it will also have the insights on that device, on device 0123. Because I know that the owner of device 0123 uh, is, is uh, 25 to 34 years old, he's male, he's tech savvy, he's a pet owner, and a lot of other insights I have. And those insights will be written in the same record to this bucket. Excuse me? You sure. get all these insights from um, mining uh, raw data on the phone? 
I get all these insights from mining raw data on the phone, doing some process, some dimensionality reduction, sending it back to our server, running additional processing, machine learning algorithms, both on CPU and on GPUs, and then running an additional accumulation algorithm on that. Can you give an example of how do you deduce the sex of a user? Yeah, but I can give it later because I'm running out of time. <laughs> so talk to me after, and I'll be happy well, to I can give a simple number of selfies. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. One important thing is that um, the data in DynamoDB, it's, it could be costly to read. So, since I already know the devices that I will be uh, referring to, because I will only be referring to devices that we Received, we received events on on the last day. So if I know those devices are the ones that I'm going to need their insights, it will be a, a huge waste of money to read it from DynamoDB. As I said, reading from DynamoDB can be pretty costly. So what I do, when I generate the insights for the last day, I not only write them to the DynamoDB table, I also write them to ElastiCache. ElastiCache is an additional service by Amazon, which just runs either memcached or redis to memcaching services in a distributed cluster <coughs> so that's pretty pretty fast pretty expensive as well but we only store data for devices from the last 24 hours there so it doesn't grow that much and now for the last part of our map reduce we want to take the aggregate data that we created and generate a subset so now our uh, output should be an aggregation pair app, country, age, gender, and subset type. So for example, a record in the results would be in the application Black Deferred, in the US for males age 25 to 34 who purchased in-app goods worth a total of more than $500. Obviously all of this is for the last 30 days because that's the data that I poured in. 70% are tech savvy, 40% are commuters, etc. So now I've actually created a subset of the users and I have the insights on that subset, the statistics. Now, as you can understand, there is some automatic processing done here. For example, I was talking about the event of an app being opened. That event is sent automatically because I can identify when the app is opened by the user. That means that the engagement subset is a subset that I create automatically because I can calculate how engaged is a user according to how much he opens the app during the last 30 days. But more complicated scenarios could be created but they would require some manual interfering. Uh, I've even written an example down for it. Uh, which is really handy um, and my example is for example a productivity app okay if you have if you created a productivity app you can send an event to our SDK every time the user creates a new task for himself in his to-do list and you can send an event to our SDK every time the user completes a task in his to-do list and then you can create a subset of all users that completed at least 80% of the tasks they created during the last month so that requires some customization both from the developer sending those events to us and from us to create that subset because we need to define the subset as 80% of uh, those events are uh, those events so or the ratio between the event types. So it might require some interfering uh, with the code but the infrastructure is there and we can customize it for the developer's needs. Do you let the developer customize subset by itself? No, it's just for the big ones. <laughs> it's all we server do it for side. Them if they're big enough and interesting enough. Probably. It's all server side, but the infrastructure is good enough, so it requires from us very little coding. We just need to coordinate with the developer. And the result is this another example from our dashboard. You can see that I've filtered here. I decided not to filter according to country, I did filter for males. 25 to 34 years old. And you can see that this specific app that I'm showing has 630,000 monthly active users, which are males aged 25 to 34, 
but only 500 of those are paying. Paying users are those that actually uh, expanded some money on the application during the last month. And you can see statistics, for example, who are the heavy mobile users, the parents, night owls, tech savvy, travelers, early birds, commuters, and gamers. And the statistics on those uh, devices, on the total subset of people, and on the specific subset of paying users, how those statistics look. So that comparison already gives you a lot of insight into who your users are in general and who your users that are actually paying for in app purchases. Okay, so it is my understanding that I'm quite running out of time and noise apparently. <laughs> now I need to, to talk more clearly now that I don't have any more background noise to cover my words. So uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll just go ahead a bit quicker. That's this is another I example. Have no Sorry. Question. I have five more minutes. I have five more minutes. Yeah, That's no great. Question. So I'll go with you over this. <laughs> This is actually what I've already shown you. This is the MapReduce after MapReduce after MapReduce. But we've decided we want something else. We want to show data for applications that we're not integrated into. How do we do that? Well, that's pretty sure. Why do MapReduce after MapReduce instead of, I don't know, using uh, I don't, I don't decoupling? That's why we did it. We did because it for each time you write it in a string, it takes so long. It, it takes long, but since we run it only once a day, oh. it's okay. Um, if we wanted to run it once an hour, things would be a bit different, I agree. But we get a lot of decoupling here. I've mentioned that the results here are, are daily, so this MapReduce takes the results from the last 30 days from this MapReduce. That's great decoupling. We're actually reusing the data generated every day by this MapReduce. We're reusing it 29 times, which is useful. Uh, so yeah, what I was talking about is that I want to show data of apps that we're not integrated into. Obviously, I'm not getting events from those apps, so I don't know how is the engagement, how the users, how many users are paying, and what uh, what identifies those users. But I can talk generally about those users. I can generate analytics on those users. How do I do it? Well, I already talked about creating mock events. So all I need to do is identify what applications are installed on each device and generate mock events for all those applications. If, I'm, if I have the SDK running on my device inside an application that we're integrated into, but I identify that on my device there's also, I don't know, um, uh, Candy Crush and uh, all those games and I don't know what else, then I can just generate um, mock events for each of those applications as well. That would tell all the system that I have those applications installed on my device. So as long as we're installed on enough devices to create uh, some good statistics, we can utilize those installations to get insights into other apps as well, those that we're not integrated into. And an example for that is the Slack app. I'm not sure if you know it. It's um, it's a general needs uh, chat and communication application that also has a desktop version, and not, a, not only a mobile version, and is directed mostly at uh, companies for communications within the company. It's a nice application, and uh, it's marketed especially towards high-tech companies. And you can see that here by seeing that 90% of the users are males, because unfortunately that's the way the market is at the moment. And you can see that indeed on the right hand of our uh, dashboard you don't get any data because we're not really integrated into that app. You can also see uh, correlated apps that is another mechanism that we create uh, which gives a score of the probability of other apps going along with this app. So, which basically means that if the user has these apps it has, he has the high propensity of installing the Slack app as well. Um, that's no surprise that those that use Slack, which as I said is marketed mostly to high tech companies, also have Stack Exchange, TechCrunch, uh, Asana, Trello, and those apps installed on these devices as well. So, that's a nice example, or at least I think it's a nice example. And now I want to mention the next generation. 
The next generation for the SDK server, we want to get rid um, from all those old-fashioned services and go towards a more um, application as a service. And for that, we wish to use two services from Amazon, which are brand new. The one is the, the first is called API Gateway, the second is called Lambda. The API Gateway is a great Amazon service, and I'm not trying to advertise for AWS or anything. That I'm not getting any royalties from it. Maybe you should call them. Maybe I can get something. Sorry, we're paying them. So. We're paying them. Yeah. Um, API Gateway is just. An API, you define it in a console, you define the exact uh, URL paths that you want to support, and you define what do you want it to do when someone actually accesses those URLs. Lambda is a code running service. You can just tell it whenever you need to run code, this is the code that you should run, and it creates the environment automatically. You don't need to maintain the servers yourself. So, in other, in other words, what you can define here is that every time you get access to your server, to a certain URL, it should just run a predetermined uh, block of code, which is exactly what we're doing, but we're also maintaining the whole environment. This is much simpler, and it scales indefinitely also, and it doesn't require any maintenance at all, which is pretty comfortable. So, what we just need to run... Do you know what the latency is on the new... Sorry? The latency about Lambda and the API Gateway? No, I haven't checked it. It's a great question. Obviously, there's a lot of research we'll need to do and a sort of proof of concept before we can actually implement it that way. But I do know that it's already in use. Whether it will be good enough for our use case, well, I'll, I'll, we should obviously research before implementing it. How do you pay the <laughs> AWS Lambda? It's not easy to, so you're not going to pay by. The time, is, uh, the time you run it because the number, the size of the, the machine or is it to you, you choose to take and it's not a service that you're going to pay for each request you're going to do so what, how do you, how do you pay to... How, how do you pay AWS? Yeah. Well, first of all, I believe AWS can answer that question. <laughs> so it's a question that, as I, as I just answered, it's some research that we need to do because it might be that we'll be paying a lot more for using the Lambda service. But it does have a pricing model that is based on runtime, obviously, and on the incoming and outgoing data as well, if I remember correctly. And so there's still research to do, I'm just explaining the concept because it's something that is worth exploring, uh, especially since those two services are pretty new. Lambda service exists for like five months or something. No, it's more, more than a year. Mm -hmm. Sorry? It's, it's since last yeah. uh, reinvent. General availability? No, Lambda is more than a year. For general availability. Oh, yeah. I'm using it more than a year. <laughs> so this okay. was introduced more than a year. I've heard it, it's up for general availability about five to six months ago, and I've heard that they added Python natively just about three months ago or something like that. Before that, you had to run Python on uh, the JVM for it to work, which I Not don't yet. much care for. Uh, just a comment about uh, this kind of architecture. Yeah. First of all, every first request will have some latency, even uh, several seconds. And I believe for your kind of application, it will become very expensive if you at, at real scale. Uh, until few million requests per month, it will be even free. Mm -hmm. But if you have like hundreds of millions or billions of requests per month, it will be very expensive, like order magnitude expensive than regular servers. Yeah, that's usually the way AWS works. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you have something in the middle. You can use EC, ECS instead of EC2. With Docker and, and instead of to, uh, using internet service. Yeah, yeah that, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of other options, and as I said, we will need to research, but for me, those are the new and shiny objects that I want to play with. So it's obviously the first thing that I will check, both in terms of viability and uh, uh, in terms of the service it provides, and both in terms of costs. Uh, but it is an architecture that would work whether expensive or uh, or not and whether with high latency or not and it's something that we will uh, aim to explore. Another use case that Lambda could be very useful for is that you can trigger Lambda for each file written to an S3 bucket. So we can't replace the deep learning servers with Lambda because they're GPUs and Lambda doesn't support GPUs at the moment. 
but the device servers and the inside servers, those that, those that accumulate the data to the device and do the uh, initial processing, and the inside server that actually create the insights from all the accumulated data, those can be replaced with Lambda. And not only that, we can get rid of those SQS queues that deliver the messages, because Lambda, as I said, can be triggered from the file being written to the S3 bucket. So we can just write a, a, a data submission coming in from the SDK to the bucket, and just have Lambda trigger automatically, take the data, process it, and write the results. And the last one that I want to mention, which is the biggest pain point for me in all this lecture, is the one where I just write all the events coming into a local file in the instance, and then once an hour I upload that file to S3. For that, we wish to use Amazon Kinesis Firehose, which is a new service, this one I'm sure of. <laughs> it's about a month old or something like that. It's based on Amazon Kinesis, which is a, a, a sort of a streaming service, much like, a, much like modern queues provide, like RevitMQ and Kafka provide, uh, but as a service uh, delivered by Amazon. And it builds on it to create a fire hose. The fire hose, you can write whatever data you want into it, and you can configure it to automatically write files to S3. It will automatically automatically write files to S3 uh, using a predetermined set of rules. So I can just write from Lambda or from EC2 instances all the incoming events to uh, Kinesis Firehose, and it will periodically be written to files to S3. Well, I'll skip the last part, the bonus part, I'm assuming you know ELK. We implemented it over Amazon. You can ask me about it if you wish. And I'll just say that, uh, shameless advertising, uh, we're currently hiring. You're more than welcome to talk to me, server developers, algorithm developers, full stack web developers, and DevOps engineers. That's it. Thank you very much.